great. Welcome to panel two. Uh, and we will go in the order as it is on, their, uh, on our program. So we'll start with Sarah Adams. Uh, the U-505 divulges her secrets. During World War II, one small engagement off the coast of Africa had far-reaching consequences and helped the United States further the cause of Project Ultra. But of even more importance, it provided technical information that helped protect convoys from predation by the German wolf packs. Let's take a look at that engagement. Aha, uh -huh, it worked. <laughs> Project Ultra was the coat breaking efforts at Bletchley Park. It has generally been portrayed as a solely British effort. The contribution towards that endeavor, namely that of the United States, has largely been overlooked. There is no doubt that the British were at the forefront of decoding the Enigma machine. They were working on and decoding messages before the United States entered the war. Much of Project Ultra was kept secret from the United States, and the British, who, in their efforts to protect the secret, were not very forthcoming with sharing information. The Enigma machine was developed before the war as a way for businesses and banks to communicate privately. The machine had a series of wheels from three to five uh, that could be manipulated to create a starting point. The message would be typed out on a keyboard and a light would illuminate a separate letter. With each letter, the wheels would advance, changing the code. At the receiving end, another machine was needed to set to the same starting point so that the message could be decoded. Each day, the Germans would change their code, making any decoding efforts useless every 24 hours. Despite these hardships, the British were successful in decoding messages sent to the Luftwaffe. This meant that they could intercept the bombers and evacuate areas to reduce casualties. They allowed some attacks to succeed so that the Germans would not suspect that their messages were being decoded. The British were willing to do anything to protect the secret of Project Ultra. The German submarine service part of the Kriegsmarine was small at the beginning of World War II. It consisted of mostly older style submarines left over from World War I that were better suited to mine laying. While the Germans lacked a large enough navy that would be capable of challenging the combined forces of the French and British navies, they did have the stealth capabilities of their submarines and experienced captains from World War I who had practiced unrestricted warfare. The smaller U-boats were perfectly suited to cruise the waters around France and England, effectively causing disruptions in shipping to and from Britain. This battle for the control of shipping would become known as the Battle of the Atlantic, which has been categorized by David Syrit, a Navy historian, as the longest, largest, and most complex naval battle in history. German U-boats began attacking and sinking targets in the Atlantic Ocean early in the war. Britain responded by creating a blockade around German ports in the North Bay and Baltic Sea. This failed to stem the capabilities of German manufacture, however, and the Germans were able to develop larger and more capable submarines. Slowly and surely, the Germans tightened a stranglehold on England by creating shortages of supplies to the island nation through the sinking of their supply convoys. The Germans developed a new type of sonar-guided torpedo in an effort to increase the effectiveness of their submarines in the Atlantic. These acoustic torpedoes made it possible for a sub-commander to fire in a general direction of a convoy, then dive to 200 meters and hide before the escort vessels even knew they were there. By 1943, the Germans developed the G7E Zonkoning torpedo, which was faster and better able to home in on the sound of fast-moving warships as well as merchant traffic. 
After the United States entered World War II in 1942, it became important to wrest control of the Atlantic from the Germans. The largest threat to the convoys were the submarine wolf packs. To neutralize this threat, the United States created hunter-killer task groups. The development of radar to aid in spotting submarines on the surface helped the U.S. to be successful with this tactic. The U.S. used light, fast ships, which enabled them to be more maneuverable. Task groups consisted of an escort carrier and four or five destroyer escorts. These were smaller ships that had their weight trimmed down even further by excluding watertight compartments within the bulkheads, which is a very dangerous practice. Just look at Titanic. <laughs> Captain Daniel V. Gallery was assigned as the commander of Task Group 22.3, which I'm going to call TG 22.3 from here on out. <laughs> Um, this task group consisted of six ships, an escort aircraft carrier, the U.S. Guadalcanal, and five destroyer escorts. Captain Gallery had a crazy idea to capture a German sub rather than just sink it. He came up with this idea when he was involved in the sinking and capture of the men from the U-515. He said, after we picked up Hanke and survivors of his crew, it struck us that here was an ace of the U-boat fleet, a man of proved courage and skill. Yet when cornered, he didn't fight. He didn't blow up his boat. He and his crew of veterans abandoned ship in confusion. The startling conclusion was that if we had ceased firing and had called away boarding parties immediately, we might have boarded and captured the U-515. Now, Henke, in this quote, is Werner Henke, who was captain of the U-515 at the time of her, of her sinking. If TG-22.3 was able to capture a submarine, then they would be able to get the knowledge contained within her for the United States. On June 4th, 1944, TG-22.3 was off the western coast of Africa near Cape Blanco when a submarine contact was made by the USS Chatelain. It was the U-505, commanded by Uber Lieutenant Harold Lang. From this point on, it was a game of maneuver and countermaneuver, with the eventual outcome of the U-505 being forced to the surface, where Lang gave the order to scuttle her and abandon ship. As the submarine ran in a tight circle to the right, Crouching figures popped out of the conning tower and plunged overboard. The order to cease fire and the infamous away boarders was given by Commander Hall aboard the USS Shadowing. Quickly, boarding teams were sent to the sub, and by a very lucky chance, the sea strainer was capped to prevent the U-505 from sinking. The capture of the U-505 contained a wealth of information for the United States. They managed to get an Enigma machine of their own and decoding materials. They were also two of the G-70 Zaconing torpedoes on board. The crew of the U-505 was picked up out of the ocean and taken prisoner. A tone line was attached, attached to the sub and she was taken to Bermuda. The United States gave the coding materials to the British in an agreement that stated the British would share information important to the Americans that was gained through Project Ultra. Captain Gallery, though, almost faced a very different consequence for the capture of the U-505 than that of a war hero. The Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Ernst J. King, gave Captain Gallery what has been described of as a severe dressing down. Admiral King pointed out that unless the capture of the U-505 remained an absolute secret, the Germans would change their codes immediately and send the efforts of Project Ultra back to the beginning, which could have resulted in a court-martial for Captain Gallery. The analysis of the torpedoes 
revealed that they homed in on the sound of cavitation caused by the action of propellers on a ship. With this information, the Allies were able to develop an acoustic buoy that could be towed behind ships to attract the torpedo by creating a louder cavitation noise. They were also able to uh, create a set of protocols for the deployment of that buoy. The combination of materials gleaned from the U-505 provided the information to drive the Germans from the Atlantic. The Enigma machine, along with the code books, provided Bletchley Park with a month's worth of code breaking. The United States was able to thus contribute to Bletchley Park and gain access to the Germans' messages. The secret of Project Ultra was protected and able to provide information throughout the war, which allowed the Allies to bring the Nazi regime to an end. The technical information provided by the captured G7E torpedoes helped in the development of countermeasures. The deployment of co those countermeasures provided protection to the buoys, bringing supplies to Great Britain. Eventually, the convoys brought equipment and men to England that would be essential during D-Day. It might have been one small engagement off the coast of Africa, but it had far-reaching effects influencing the end of the war. I Terrific, great start to a great panel. Uh, next up is Damon Staub, and he will be talking about, let me get our program situated, um, the origins of modern intelligence, room 40, and code breaking during World War I. Thank you. All right, as Dr. Eric and Satan, I'm going to be talking about um, the origins of modern intelligence. Um, so there are a multitude of operations and procedures that are used during war times to keep the length of a war as short as possible. Espionage and intelligence gathering have long been tools governments have used to quickly weaken their enemy and keep the number of casualties to, um, to a minimum. Intelligence during World War I was gathered in ways never before attempted due in part to technological advancements. The British made the modern, modernization of intelligence possible in 1914 with the creation of Room 40. This, the organization made the, this organization and its creators, such as Sir James Alfred Ewing and Sir William Blinker Hall, played key roles during the war and would serve as predecessors to future intelligence agencies. Through the innovative method of signal intelligence, Room 40 established a national need for a permanent system of gathering intelligence and laid the groundwork for a modern era of espionage, heavily impacting the 20th century. The organization would turn out to be a major shift in realizing the importance of code breaking and intercepting messages. Room 40 was a secret center of British naval intelligence during the First World War. It was officially founded in 1914 after, Henry, after Admiral Henry Oliver and the British Navy, Royal Navy came across German naval code books with the assistance of Russia. Oliver turned to the director of naval education, Professor Alfred Ewing, for the help in decrypting these German messages. Ewing and, and William Reginald Hall led the charge in creating this system Room 40 used. They used teams to gather signal intelligence, that is, information sent over radio, over radio and telegram signals, on a large scale by listening to enemy radio frequencies and cutting telegram cables. The information obtained was encrypted and required other people to, to decipher it. Once decrypted, it was up to an analysis to figure out how to use the information in aiding the war efforts. These teams went on to uncover over 80 million words during the span of the war. The extreme amount of information discovered proved that the signal intelligence would, was and would be highly valuable. There is plenty of information within academic literature that illustrates Room 40 was in many ways the beginning of modern intelligence systems. Historians such as David Boyle and Michael Heffernan argue that Room 40 was the first large-scale attempt to use technology like radios and telegra telegrams to gather signal intelligence. Historian Philip Vickers takes Boyle's and Heffernan's argument further by stating that the ambition of Admiral Hall and is what led Room 40 to be successful in finding, in finding new ways to gather information. 
A final piece of supporting evidence comes from historian Barbara Tuchman. She argued Room 40 opened the eyes of world leaders to the importance of establishing permanent organizations and advancing intelligence systems when they intercepted the infamous Zimmerman telegram. These historians and their evidence helped create the idea that Room 40 was a new concept that, beca that became a precedent in the modern era of intelligence. Room 40 was created to help defend Britain against German fleets, and it proved to be highly successful. This success, in turn, created the need for a permanent establishment of intelligence agencies. In the couple of decades leading up to the, leading up to the creation of Room 40, Britain was facing a growing threat from the rising German fleet. Britain never had a serious naval competitor prior to this point, therefore there was never any serious reason to establish an intelligence system as complex as Room 40. This changed in the late 19th and early 20th century, in the early 20th centuries when reports began warning that Germany was successfully implementing new technology into their navy with the creation of their U-boats. Under Hall's leadership at Room 40, radio signals were being used to know in advance where and when enemy ships would be located after, me after messages were being inter intercepted indicating where they would be located. With the ability to locate potential threats at sea, many major disasters were avoided. To have the option to pick and choose which conflicts to fight, Room 40 became a valuable asset to Room 40. Okay. All right. Um, not only did Room 40 establish a system of defense through intelligence, but it also proved that some overlap between military branches can be a good thing. Prior to Room 40, there was no centralization of intelligence information between branches. The military and the Navy did not always agree on methods of how to obtain information on the enemy, nor did they always share crucial information. There are two moments during the war where Room 40 united the different branches. According to David Boyle, after months of frustration with the lack of information coming in, the military decided to send an officer to witness the workings of Room 40. The officer, the officer was so impressed with the efficiency of the organization that the military, too, began using signal intelligence. Through the willingness to educate other branches on how to use technology to gather intelligence, Room, for, Room 40 largely contributed to the growth of modern intelligence. Following the end of the war, the success of Room 40 had, punished, had pushed the British government to create a permanent bond between the military and Navy. They did this by establishing a new organization known as the Government Code and Cipher School in 1919, otherwise known as the GC and CS. This was a peacetime intelligence agency that was a co continuation of Room 40 in many ways. It focused on using signal intelligence um, and was headed by Alistair Denniston, a former official of Room 40. This organization had a major impact on the 20th century. It was thanks to them, these former members of Room 40, that Bletchley Park accomplished the task it did during World War II. Bletchley Park was the home of GC and CS during World War II, and they employed physicists, mathematicians, chemists, language analysts, women and men alike, pretty much anyone, anyone with an intelligent mind able to aid in the war effort. This was the same manner in which Room 40 operated as well. The GC and CS and Alan Turing and his Ultra Machine were heavily influenced by the operations that, under, that were under, underwent at Room 40. Even today, parts of Room 40 and the GC and CS still remain under the name of the British Government Communications Headquarters. Without their training and success at Room 40, people like Alistair Denniston wouldn't have been as intelligent on the subject of comb breaking and arguably the slow, slowing the time it took to break an enigma. The biggest piece of, of, of information that technology and signal intelligence and code breaking highly influenced the outcome of, war, of the war in 1917 when Room 40 inter intercepted the Zimmer was, sorry, was an, highly influenced, Room 40, in, sorry. At this point in the war, neither side seemed to be, ga seemed to be gaining any ground. According to Barbara Tuchman, the situation was a stalemate. Both sides had been fighting, fighting for three years and everyone was drained physically and mentally. The Germans attempted to break the stalemate by getting Mexico involved in a war with the United States. They sent a telegram telling Mexico they had Germany's full support in invading the southern borders of the United States. However, the, the, men, in room 40, the men and women of Room 40 intercepted the message by tapping, tapping into subatlantic telegram cables. According to, Tuch, according to Tuchman, 
the, the interception and leak of Zimmerman Telegram was arguably the turning point of the war. Prior to Room 40's discovery, the United States was doing their best to remain neutral in the event, with some exceptions, of course. The Zimmerman Telegram provided motive for the United States to enter the war in alliance with Britain. Not only did Room 40's discovery of the Zimmerman Telegram turn the tide of war, but the method of wiretapping and obtaining messages is something that countries would continue using throughout the 20th century. During the Cold War, wiretapping was a, a form of signal intelligence used by, by the British, the United States, and the USSR alike. In one of the largest intelligence failures in history, the US and Britain constructed the Berlin Tunnel in the 1950s in hope of intercepting underground Soviet Union cables. The idea to intercept messages from underground or undersea lines originated from Room 40 when they intercepted the Zimmerman telegram. The Berlin Tunnel was not successful like Room 40 because it turned out the KGB knew about the plan from the start. Despite this failure, the fact that wiretapping methods were being used in the 50s illustrates that Room 40 was a predecessor for future intelligence operations through, with motives like wiretapping. Regardless of, the, of all the success and positive impacts that Room 40 had on the future of intelligence, there were also negative aspects that came out of it as well. During the years of, war, of World War I, Room 40 and all, the, all of its operations were kept extremely secret. With, and no leaks of ex existence emerged. This was an intentional design in hopes of using the same, um, the same system successfully again if needed. Within the years following the war, operatives began slipping up about the organization accidentally or even purposely in hopes of receiving recognition for the work. According to David Boyle, this, this error influenced Nazi communication tools in, during, during World War II. Boyle writes, it, it so happened at the time of the leaks that the German military was considering future signal systems and the crisis persuaded them to adopt the Enigma method. This is a bold claim that Boyle makes, but it's also highly debatable. If leaks about what methods Britain was using to break codes did not surface, the Nazis very easily could have developed an inferior message scrambling tool than Enigma. World War I came at a time when the world was changing in many different aspects. Ideologies such as nationalism were being formed, creating patriotic fighters and workers for Room 40. Technology was advancing with the creation of wireless te telegra telegraphy, as well as machines like the German U-boats. The creation of Room 40 not only had a large impact on World War I, it influenced the events of the 20th century as well. It changed the way intelligence was gathered, showing the possibility of intercepting messages using signal and intelligence. It also potentially shortened the expected length and amount of casualties of World War I. Without the creation of a permanent wartime intelligence system, the British may have succumbed to the power of the German naval fleet, and the events of the 20th century could have had extremely different outcomes. Thank you. Great. Next up, um, Elizabeth Schneider, Game of Queens. Survival to a monarchy is really important because there will be those who wish up to rise to the claim the prize of power. And as we know with history, monarchies changed hands quite frequently. This meant methods would be created to keep tabs on those rebels and rebellions, and like in the game of chess, staying one step ahead of their rival. This discussion touches on some of my favorite points in history when monarchs would succeed in keeping their power or an attempt to escape from the change of hands, from Catherine de Medici to Mary Queen of Scots to Marie Antoinette. Sometimes they would reap the benefits and occasionally they would pay with their life. Catherine de' Medici was an orphan of a failed banking family from Italy. She eventually married the young French prince, Henry II, but it was an unhappy marriage. Her husband chose to be with his mistress rather than Catherine, and he gave his mistress more power than he would Catherine. During the 10 years of them trying to have children, Catherine would drill a hole in the, her bedroom floor and watch Henry and his mistress, mostly while they were being intimate to see what she was doing wrong. She claimed that she couldn't see much because she would soon start sobbing. <laughs> she eventually gave up spying on her husband and turned her attention to more important matters, like the French court. She would try to manipulate the political atmosphere and try to lessen the influence of a Gu the Guise family, who were an ultra-Catholic family, in a France where religious beliefs were changing to be more tolerant of Protestants, making Catherine de' Medici one of the most hated women in France. In doing so, she would use unusual techniques for a queen. 
Throughout her life, she employed anywhere from 50 to 300 women as part of her flying squadron, or stable of whores, as the courtiers called them. The jobs of these ladies were to seduce men at court and get information from them. <laughs> For a woman to approach a man was unheard of until Catherine de Medici showed up on the record and the job was to exchange sex for secrets for the queen. One courtier described Catherine's court as the princess, Catherine, who thought of nothing other than her ambition and who held modesty and religion to be of no value, had always a flying squadron, if I am permitted to speak in such a manner, composed of the most beautiful women in the court, whom she used it by any means to amuse the princes and lords to discover their most secret thoughts. Catherine de Medici would be the mother-in-law of Mary, Queen of Scots, who descended from the ultra-Catholic family, the Guise, and this would make Mary the ideal Queen of England instead of the Protestant Elizabeth. And unlike Elizabeth I, who was imprisoned during her sister's reign and unsure if she would ever rule, Mary had been crowned queen at six days old and viewed it as her right to rule. While she grew up in France, Mary only spent one year as queen of France, and after returning to Scotland, Mary and her cousin Elizabeth remained in contact by sending letters and gifts to one another. While Elizabeth was hopeful of a relationship with Mary, Elizabeth's spymaster, William Cecil, would always be suspicious of her. Elizabeth needed to name a successor to her throne, and Mary, also having a claim to the English throne through her great-grandfather, Henry VII, the first Tudor king, wanted it to be herself. Elizabeth entertained this thought by suggesting an English husband for Mary, but it was only a man who would ever remain loyal to Elizabeth over Mary. It was Lord Robert Dudley. Mary refused to listen to her cousin and instead married Lord Darnley, who also had a claim to the English throne through Henry VII. This marriage forever changed the relationship between Elizabeth and Mary, but the two continued to stay in touch. Mary did not have the political savvy Elizabeth did, nor did she choose her men wisely. <laughs> Lord Darnley was later murdered by strangulation after an explosion threw him out of his window. And accused of this was L Earl of Bothwell and, and an unnamed accomplice. Elizabeth urged Mary to distance herself from Bothwell and start an investigation. Mary instead married him, which seemed to suggest that she was his unnamed accomplice in Lord Darnley's murder. She was forced to abdicate her throne in favor of her son and Bothwell was told to leave in exile. Mary organized her escape in secret and surprised everyone by showing up on England's shores and asking Elizabeth for help. Elizabeth knew that her Catholic subjects would be excited to have Mary in England and urge her to take the throne. Elizabeth instead placed Mary on house arrest, a very comfortable house arrest at first. While Mary was in England, letters surfaced said to be in Mary's handwriting, plotting the death of her second husband, Lord Darnley. Mary was never allowed to inspect these letters, although her Latin teacher came forward and claimed that it was, in fact, Mary's handwriting. <coughs> Elizabeth didn't really seem to care at this point, but it led to Mary continuing to be on house arrest, and grew, she grew tired of this and sought out an alliance via marriage to Philip II of Spain, sending an optimistic message such as, Help me, I shall be Queen of England in three months, and mass shall be all over this country. The Englishmen were plotting on marrying Elizabeth off to Duke of Norfolk, but Norfolk lacked the nerve to. Unfortunately for Norfolk, he found himself in prison in the Tower of London by Elizabeth, who had found out about this plot from another spy master, Sir Francis Walsingham. More plotters soon to appear out of the woodwork, but it would slip away to France and work for Catherine de Medici. Mary continued to write to Norfolk to encourage him of their future as mar of marriage and reign together, but placed in Mary's household at this time was Countess of Shrewsbury, called Bess, who would write to Cecil, Elizabeth's spymaster, every day. Bess would say Mary would seek her out and they only talked of gossip. Cecil encouraged her to continue to listen to this gossip, even if it was only Mary lashing out at Elizabeth for keeping her on house arrest, as well as helping her embroider cushions and tapestries that depicted Elizabeth as being barren, as well as indicating some of Elizabeth as a predator. After taking down a rebellion in the north, Elizabeth was forced to realize that having Mary in England would always prove to be a threat to the throne. Cecil, still in contact with those in Mary's household, was informed Mary was still embroidering tapestries of Elizabeth's failure as a woman, and she was also still seeking an alliance with Spain. All this came out, even her one-time mother-in-law, Catherine de Medici, gave up favor of her. 
Elizabeth's two loyal spy masters, Cecil and Walsingham, searched Mary's belongings and finally discovered incriminating letters as well as a coding alphabet amongst them. After a trial where Mary denied all these plots, Elizabeth struggled to make up her mind. In the end, the only choice was to have Mary executed and put an end to all the plots. Another queen that took pleasure, the pursuit of pleasure, and had rumors swirl about her love life as well as scandal was Marie Antoinette. Before the French Revolution, Marie had been a creature of pleasure. She did not enjoy reading or listening to political talks and instead preferred operas and ballets and her own chateau where she dressed like a commoner and pretended to be a peasant on a farm. Her mother employed Count Mercy to be Marie's ambassador and unknown to Marie, he acted as a spy for her mother. He employed her ladies in waitings and, oh. <coughs> Got a little overexcited. <laughs> he employed Marie's ladies in waitings and gathered information, which he then sent to Marie's mother in Austria. Marie Antoinette did not catch on to the gravity of political life until it was too late to turn back. Only when the poor started to revolt did the queen start to show an interest in French politics, and it was only because the people wanted a parliament like in England, and Marie did not. When they stormed the castle and took the king and queen prisoner, did Marie fully dive into reading and writing letters. She taught herself to write in code, but it would take her an entire night to write a letter. But when she did, she did, she showed bravery that her husband could not. She orchestrated her and her family's escape from Paris during the reading of a declaration to the crowd outside. They did not notice the large traveling party that was leaving the coach. A woman in waiting, a child's nurse, a girl about 12, and her younger sister around six years old, and a woman who was the owner of the couch. Unknown to a casual observer, it was the King Marie Antoinette, the King's sister, Madame Elizabeth, Marie Therese, and Louis Charles dressed as a young girl. Marie Antoinette's escape was not discovered until the next morning at seven, and America's own Thomas Paine would be informed and replied, let them go. This was not to be the route taken. The French people set out on a manhunt to find the escaped royal family. The queen and her family were discovered only 40 miles away from the Austrian border in a carriage. Their fate was sealed. Catherine de' Medici and Elizabeth I would not have been guaranteed power, but realized how delicate the monarchy was. They employed spies to keep on top of the political climate as well as any threat to their throne. Mary, Queen of Scots, and Marie Antoinette would not be so keen on ruling their nation until the threat of it was being taken away. When the threat did rise, they fought to keep it, including teaching themselves code. The survival of the monarchy should be the first on every new ruler's mind. Some would take it seriously, while others would not. The rulers with the knowledge and outlook to stay one step ahead of the, in the game of chess usually survive. The rulers who are just there to enjoy the game of chess usually end up in checkmate and a hedge shorter, such as Marie Antoinette and Mary Queen of Scots. Oh. <laughs> okay, for our last, um, uh, panelists today, uh, uh, Fyodor Wheeler, a question history, going to have to help me with the pronunciation, uh, Procopius? Procopius? Procopius, right. Um, uh, secret history and its content. The historian Procopius of Caesarea gives a bleak and sordid description of the Byzantine Empire under Justinian in the 6th century CE. His book, The Secret History, is not only an expose of the Byzantine elite, but an indictment of its corruption and cruelty. In it, he attacks everything from offices held by unqualified and greedy individuals to Empress Theodora's scandalous background and the divisions in Christendom that she and her husband, Justinian, promoted. The most wild claim he makes is that Justinian was not human at all, but in fact a demon. <laughs> Many of his accusations, including that one, appear to be nothing but rumors and slander. They are a complete contradiction of his earlier writings in The Wars, where Justinian is depicted as a good, upright leader. Despite the obvious sensationalism in the, in his, in the introduction to his translation of the history, Dr. Anthony Caldellis claims it is the most reliable source in the period. My question is, can this be true? So what is the secret history and can it be trusted? Procopius was greatly influenced by classic literature, classical literature. He cleverly references two of Aristophanes' comedies in describing the misdealings of the referendi, officials who delivered petitions to the governor, saying, they mastered all the unjust arguments that they had heard from every person and would deceive Justinian with sophistries and various verbal tricks. Unjust argument is a character from the play Clouds and verbal tricks references the play Nights. 
public affairs, he observes resignedly in the same section, were now entirely in a wretched state and names did not even retain their proper meaning, an allusion to Thucydides. Procopius had learned enough from other authors to, in the past to apply their ideas to his own time. However, his greatest influence was Christianity, and the history reflects the faith's integral role in Byzantine society. Christology, the study of Christ's nature, was the main source of religious controversy in this century. The debate was, primar was primarily between Chalcedonian Christology, which states Christ is one person with two natures, human and divine, and the Monophysite Christology, which says Christ is one person but only has one nature, the divine. A stable religious system was necessary for a stable empire, and religious debates often had serious re re political repercussions. Procopius himself writes as a Christian greatly angry with Justinian's abuses of religion. In chapter 10 of The Secret History, he accuses Justinian and Theodora of setting Christians against each other and dividing them into rival fan clubs, like the blue and green racing fan club factions that threatened the city's stability earlier on in Justinian's reign. Justinian was a Chalcedonian Christian, while Theodora was a Monophysite, and Procopius saw this not as an honest disagreement between husband and wife, but a deliberate attempt to sabotage Christendom. From a purely, purely religious standpoint, he appears to be genuinely disgusted with Christianity being treated as a matter of fans rather than believers. That Justinian and Theodora were the masterminds of this just made it all the worse. Justinian himself is portrayed as gullible and easily led into evil. This was exemplified by his hypocritical religious actions. He seemed to have firm faith as regards Christ, Procopius writes, but this also worked to the ruin of his subjects. Justinian would allow priests to act violently and to steal, all while thinking that he was being pious towards God by doing this. He dedicated confiscated property to churches, but not for the good of Christ and his people. It was to ensure that it could not be returned to the original owners. The purpose of this and greater cruelty was to force all his subjects into one form of Christianity, killing any dissenters, all in the name of piety. The most implausible accusation made in the secret history is also of a religious nature. According to Procopius, Justinian and Theodore were not humans, but demons. This was not just his opinion. To many of us, these two never seemed to be human beings at all, but rather murderous demons of some kind. Anonymous sources claim that Justinian had actually been fathered by a demon, his head would disappear, or his face become featureless. According to, to him, all, to the secret history, Justinian never slept, ate, or drank as much as a human would require, which suggested he was a loathsome demon. <laughs> <laughs> One story says an unnamed monk on a visit to the emperor reported seeing the Lord of Demons seated upon the throne. Likewise, Theodora had demons under her power, as reported by some of her ex-lovers. <coughs> Again, no sources are, are named. Procopius openly acknowledges that his truthfulness will be called into question. I can predict that the things that I am about to write will not seem trustworthy or even plausible to posterity, he says in his preface. However, he states his contemporaries would corroborate his statements. His purpose, or what he stood to gain in writing the secret history himself, is unclear. It would be easy to say he wrote to slander Just Justinian and Theodora, but that would come at a price, to suffer a most cruel death. He claims that he could not reveal the causes of events he had recorded in other works, such as the wars, because the people involved were still alive. At this time, of the main figures of the book, only Theodora had died. Despite the possible slander and fantastic and all too often anonymous claims of the history, Caldella says it is our most reliable contemporary source on the period. That is not to say it is not embellished or biased, especially in regards to the portrayal of Justinian and Theodora. However, it is in many cases corroborated by other accounts. More vindictive literature is thought to survive from Justinian's reign than any other Roman emperor. Perhaps most damning, Justinian's own decrees reveal that some of the things Procopius says about long government were true. Novella 147 from the year 553 verifies that Justinian did not cancel tax arrears, which are payments made at the end of a period rather than advance, and Novella 105 is indeed Justinian's attempt to change the office of consul. Procopius best succeeds in teaching readers about Byzantine politics and society not through general descriptions but by recounting the events. If he, if he is to be believed, the whole social order and role of the government and church were upturned during Justinian's reign. Magistrates and, and patricians were once allowed to greet the emperor with a single salute, and people of lower classes simply required to bend the knee, and there was no required salute to the empress. With Justin and Theodora, all classes were required to fall straight on the ground, flat on their faces, then stretching their arms and legs as far as they would go, they had to touch with their lips one foot of each of the two. <laughs> 
Procopius says Justinian allowed corruption to seep into politics and affect the daily lives of the people. He tended to appoint prefects who, in expectation of a share in the annual profits, gave to shopkeepers permission to sell their goods at whatever price they wanted, forcing people to pay triple price for goods, which were now not only exorbitantly expensive, but of a lower quality. The men Justinian chose for his government were the most villainous characters who bought the offices they intended to corrupt for a higher price, for a high price. Later, the emperor forewent selling the offices, now appointing his hirelings, whom he had offered a salary in exchange for, handling all, for handing all plundered assets over to him. Rome had been a welfare state since the Gracchi's reform in the late 2nd century BCE, and Justinian sought to end this. Public funds were taken away from doctors and teachers, local taxes were added to the imperial coffers, the circuses, wild beast shows, and theaters were shut down to spare the treasury the money usually given to them, which left those employed by these establishments with no livelihood. Lamps were no longer lit along the streets, there was no further concern for education, and citizens were so demoralized that they could not even speak to their priests. This sad description reveals what was once important and the norm in Byzantine education in, in, in Byzantium, education, entertainment, and charity, if we're to believe Procopius's accounts. Perhaps it is unfair to cast Justinian as the lord of demons and the enemy of humanity, as Procopius saw. He may have given credence to rumors with his work and the claim that all Justinian and Theodora wished to do was to, what, to do was destroy humanity is difficult to prove. However, many of his claims would be easily proved or disproved by common knowledge, especially of, of laws, and Procopius knew this. It is unlikely he would say that other writers could verify his statements if he made things up, and many of his claims are proved correct, assuming that other writers were being honest rather than passing on gossip. In the, case, in the cases of Justinian's laws and decrees, the evidence is obvious. What gave Procopius the confidence to write the sacred history, especially when many of his subjects were still alive, is unclear, though he states his reason for doing so. In the introduction, he imagines the future of his history and how it will be perceived by the generations to come. I reasoned it might not be advantageous for future generations were I to do so, given that it would be more in their interest if they remained ignorant of the most wicked deeds recounted herein that, than the future tyrants should learn about them and be aroused to imitate them. For most rulers, being uneducated, always find it convenient to imitate the, de the evil deeds of their predecessors, and so not as to exert themselves, they are always facially repeating the mistakes of the past. And yet in consideration, namely that it would also be made perfectly clear to future tyrants that punishment was almost certainly going to befall them on account of their wickedness, just as it did to those in my narrative. Their deeds and characters would be publicized in writing for all time, which might give some pause to their illegalities. For who in later times would have known about the shameful, the shameful lifestyle of Semiramis or the lunacy of Sardanapalos and Nero, had the memory of them not been preserved by the contemporary writers? Besides, my account will not be entirely useless to those who suffer similar things at the hands of future tyrants, if it should come to that, for there is consolation in knowing that you are not the only one to have experienced such terrible things. All right, so we've got some time for a, a few questions. Um, Mr. Schuster. Hi, thank you very much for your papers. They were all terrific. And it got me thinking, um, telling the history of a secret is a tough thing to do. Because not only are you trying to tell a history of things that people have been trying to keep away from knowledge, but you're doing it with distance uh, between you and your, and your topic as well. So my question is this, when you are thinking about telling the history of a secret, how do you balance the um, uh, treating your subject with respect? Do you want to tell their deepest, darkest secrets? Or perhaps when you're telling the secrets of the past, there are, maybe you think it's the opposite, that it is your duty to shed light on secrets that people have kept in the past. So as historians, as people dealing with the history of people, how do you weigh that right to have a secret, but then the right of the historian to find secrets? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody jump on in? Okay. Uh, good question, I Professor Schuster. Your subjects to maybe keep some of their um, actually, in my case, um, it was declassified in the 50s, and it's a huge exhibit in the Museum of Science and Industry. Everybody should go see it. Uh, um, but uh, 
it wasn't necessarily personal secrets that I had to deal with. It was um, a shrouded um, naval operation. And since it's been declassified, um, I can get access through the Navy archives um, and other sources like that directly involved in it. So for me, it's a little easier now. I don't know some of the other older sources, but. Oh, mine was um, happened over 1400 years ago. So I don't have much to lose or anything to, <laughs> anything to support with Justinian and Theodora. As I said, we have to um, assume that if we're going to study Procopius, we, we want to, to assume that his sources are also telling the truth. And so that was, I guess that's how I wanted to, thought how far you could tell other people's secrets, is to say that other people have said this. And obviously you don't have any informa much information I yourself except for in the cases like Justinian's own laws. We don't have, obviously you don't have any um, memos from Justinian say ruin um, civilization today. So, but you do have some things that prove that some things that, that, that Procopius said actually did occur. So I hope that answers the question. Probably not very well, but. Um. I had a hard time limiting how many people I talked about because I just found it all so fascinating and interesting. Um, the race to save yourself, I mean, it was really a cutthroat world these monarchies lived in. I almost think it'd be better to be a nobody than in the court, but. Um, you get dressed as a commoner. Yeah. <laughs> She's trying to tell us something. <laughs> but um, I think there's a certain amount of respect I have for all of them, even though the two. I mean, Mary, the Queen of Scots, was a little bit of a silly girl. I'll admit I had that notion after reading about her. But, um, you know, she tried to take the throne, and she felt it was her right to rule. And she did come from Henry VII, who was the Tudor king. But I felt like there was a respect I had for all of them and sharing their secrets. I felt like everyone should know because there is that respect that comes with it. Um. In reference to my subject, I think it's, like, you, you see, it, it is a, it's a subject where it's a, a, about the inner workings of organizations. So, like, organizations don't necessarily want their like, methods to be known exactly, like, down to, like, the detail. But, like, at the same time, like, the, like, the members themselves kind of do, like, use, like, as I mentioned, like, they were workers, like, purposely leaking information, like, because they wanted that, yeah, they, they took pride in their, their work and they, so I think um, to an extent, like, it, it, it does need to re be respected, like, details, but, like, if people are willing to, like, want to gain recognition for their, for, for the work that they put into something, I feel like we should, as a historian, should tell their story, so. Okay. Great. Any other questions? Yeah, in the back. Um, so yeah, yeah um, uh, what was your name again? Steve. Steve. Steve, Steve Fine Arts. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Uh, my question is for Elizabeth. I wonder if you could uh, tell us a bit more about Catherine de' Medici's background, because it strikes me that she has a very different experience coming from not only Italy to a French court, but from a different type of family to, uh, you know, a monarchy. Um, Catherine de' Medici was really interesting to me. You know, she was orphaned, and then anybody who took care of her died as well. And she was eventually raised in a convent and actually tried to convert to be a nun. But it was decided that, no, she should be used to make an alliance with France after the Medici's fell. Um, she, when she went to Italy, like outside of the convent, she really fell in love with um, the art, you know, because she was in the Renaissance. She lived the Renaissance. And I think her key of not being guaranteed anything in life other than to be a nun, no experiences, she wasn't really taught to be a queen. I think that really gave her an onsite of, well, this is how real life works outside of the monarchy. And I think that gave her one step ahead of, like, Mary, Queen of Scots, who grew up being queen. I mean, she was qu crowned at six days old. So I think that gave her an insight to life. One step ahead, one step ahead. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> More question, uh, Professor Bauer. 
Um, yeah, thanks. Another great panel, you guys. Um, my question is for Sarah. Um, going along the lines of secrecy, um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how Gallery and the Americans kept their capture secret. Because as you mentioned, um, you know, these were really important codes that were captured. And if the Nazis found out that the submarine had been captured and that the Americans had an enigma and Enigma machine, they would have changed it. Um, so yeah, if you could talk a little bit more about that. And then I was curious, were the Germans wondering where that boat was? Did they assume it was sunk? How did that all work? Okay, actually, very good question. I was hoping somebody would ask that. Um, my notes. Uh, I uh, actually, when they captured the U-505, they were going to tow it to a port in Africa because that was closer but the U.S. Navy decided that there were too many foreign spies in that port. So in order to keep the secret, one of the first things they did was tow it across the Atlantic to Bermuda. Um, they kept the prisoners um, separate from the other prisoners um, so that nobody would find out that these people were still alive. And it wasn't until... 1947 when the last of the prisoners um, from the U-505 was released and allowed to return to Germany. Um, they were denied Red Cross aid so that the Red Cross wouldn't even know that they were around. And during the time that the U-505 was captured, the Germans were losing a lot of submarines. So the sentiment in Germany itself was that it was another case where the submarine was sank with all hands. So they were assumed dead. <laughs> okay, so um, that is it for our time, 1110. <laughs>